Today on the Roundtable Perspective, Dr. David Pick joins me to talk about cognition and familiarity bias. David has been experimenting uh, with cognition for over 35 years and currently he's working on a um, hypothesis that when we are not consciously trying to weigh um, alternative options and trying to be objective that we fall back on something that he calls familiarity bias. In other words, uh, if nothing else is uh, influencing us, we go with what is most familiar. This is something that might impact us when we're making decisions during political campaigns. For instance, often the candidate with the most name recognition gets elected, not necessarily the person who um, ran the best campaign or, uh, or made the best arguments. Also, something that impacts purchasing, uh, and so it's a marketing issue, and maybe even impact us when we're dating and doing other things. Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Tom Roach. I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. David Pick. Uh, Dr. Pick has been researching cognition for uh, approximately 35 years. And um, I'd like to talk to today about uh, some of the experiments he's doing. But uh, first, uh, David, uh, tell us about um, this quote. Uh, David gave me a quote, and it says, a reliable way to make people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition because familiarity is not easily distinguished from truth. Authoritarian institutions and marketers have always known this fact. And the quote is from Daniel Kahneman, uh, a fellow researcher. Uh, tell, us, tell us what context this is referring to. Well, I don't really consider him a fellow researcher because he won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, but okay. anyway, he's, uh, uh, he has spent a career uh, developing something that's come to be called behavioral economics. He got the Nobel Prize in economics for his work on uh, decision making. Uh, traditional economic theory would say that we maximize our benefits and minimize our losses. A very, in psychology, that'd be a very behavioristic view sure. with punishments and, and, and reinforcements and whatnot. And what he's demonstrated, along with Amos Tversky, who didn't share the prize because he didn't live long enough, uh, it demonstrated that's not the way we make decisions. We make decisions on the, on the basis of, of biases. And some of these biases run through the phylogenetic scale. In other words, not just us, right. assuming we're at the top, but down through the scale. So, okay, so um, when we vote in presidential elections, when we um, are hiring someone after uh, doing a couple interviews, mm -hmm. uh, when we're choosing uh, what product to buy, you're saying that um, there are a number of different biases. Now, the one I've been biases with, that are influencing our decisions that exactly, we're not aware of, right? Yes. And, and that these aren't just cultural biases, and they're not even just human bias. They're actually something that runs through. Through down at least as far as horses, as far as I know. That's pretty interesting. OK, um, so for example. Well. Uh, People wonder why anybody puts a yard sign out for, uh, to promote their election. Sure. Uh, but it's another application of this familiarity bias. If an individual has name recognition, as they call it, mm -hmm. and somebody, an uninformed voter, let's say, uh, goes in and votes even though they don't know who they're voting for, if there's one candidate who's familiar and there's another candidate who isn't familiar, let's say in the same party, in a primary, they're going to take the familiar one if they vote mm -hmm. at all. Well, now, um, if, sometimes we don't always follow what's the, the familiar bias, of course. Sure. Right? I mean, so sure. that we do you know, uh, intellectually override sure. this from time to time. Right. So am I correct in saying that, that your, your, your argument is essentially that, that this, this bias influences us often, not necessarily all the time, right? right. Yes. Okay. And, and so how do, you, um, how do you experiment with horses, for instance, all right. to, to right. explore this? Well, the first time I observed it in horses, I wasn't expecting it, and I couldn't explain it. Uh, it's, it was 30 years ago when people thought horses and most domestic animals were totally colorblind. Uh, 
So I was doing an experiment, and it took me about a year. I've heard that yeah. you know my dog was colorblind and sure. et cetera, et cetera. Right? Well, most often they're not black and white colorblind. They're dichromats, as we say. Okay. Uh, like colorblind humans who can really see some colors, but right. yeah. But anyway, so uh, I spent about a year training this horse to discriminate between various shades of blue and various uh, shades of gray, various intensities, reflectance values. Uh, well, how did you do that? Well, I had a two-choice apparatus. This isn't one of those deals where the horse has to go like this. <laughs> no, 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 okay. no, no, none of that. <laughs> but right. anyway, so. I'd, uh, uh, a starting post and a choice oh, about 10 feet away on both sides, uh, a blue panel versus a gray panel. And like okay. there were, there were uh, five different uh, reflectance values of gray with matching blues and they're alternating on sides, okay? Yeah. So the horse was at a starting post, po post at the base of the T and when it was released, if it went to the correct side, the side with the blue, wavelength, it would get just a sprinkling of Farmer Brown's oats feed. Okay. Right, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. But anyway. Like uh, Dewey's Pizza for a horse. Right? Yeah. Oh man, uh, they go for it, for okay. sure. But anyway, uh, so that sounds very simple. It was tedious. Color doesn't mean much to a horse. I think it's easier to train him to ride. Right. Anyway, uh, so after about a year, uh, I could demonstrate in a double blind situation where any time blue was present versus gray, it would go to blue, okay? Uh, my criteria- Regardless of what the reward was? Oh, the reward is always for blue. Oh, I see, okay, sure. And if it went to gray, it yeah. just had to wait an extra minute before yeah. another trial started, which is something this horse that I have in mind did not okay. care for, okay? You might even say it was punished to go to gray, yeah. okay? So, uh, I had randomized sequences with all these various intensities and I had matching uh, greens and reds to the blues. Uh, so I thought I'd just substitute uh, the values of the reds for the blues, okay? And I wouldn't have to shape this behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, the first 20 times this particular horse had a choice between red and gray, red it hadn't seen before and gray it had seen an awful lot, it went to gray. Ah, why? Yeah. There is a learning theory in the world that would predict that, okay? And right, I, because if anything, you've demonstrated to the horse that it will get punished if it goes to gray, right? You might say so the that. the only reason yeah. it would go to gray would be familiarity. Well, that didn't cross my mind until I read Kahneman's book 20 years later. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I didn't publish those results, but I did replicate it more recently yeah. uh, with a horse. And uh, I didn't And get, you, did, you replicated it? Replicated it with a probability of 0.0175, right. something. It wasn't 20 times in a row, right, but right. it was still, still very uh, statistically significant. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I, you know, I, I remember um, um, in my, my research in uh, my rhetoric field, uh, I was looking at the, uh, the Nixon campaign in 1968, and Nixon had run for president, of course, in 60 and, uh, and lost, and then ran for governor of California, I think in 62, and lost. And um, he was, you know, the, the party put him up in 68 to run again, and they, um, they hired an advertising uh, executive named Joe McGinnis to run the campaign, and McGinnis's theory was that um, since Nixon didn't fare well in debates and interactions with the news media, that they would, they would use the advertising campaign that they had used for ivory soap. So, and, and the idea was that they, they, they were selling ivory soap as your mother's soap, the familiar product, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they were, they were presenting Nixon as the familiar candidate, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that was the, I mean, he wrote a whole book on this called The Making of the President. Essentially, mm -hmm. he was saying, we, we sold somebody as a president of the United States running on the familiarity principle. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the founders, you might call him, of behaviorism yeah. in psychology, J.B. Watson, actually got kicked out of psychology, graduate student involved. Um, but anyway, right. he, he, uh, he got a job at an ad agency and he worked for Ivory Soap. Oh, uh, really? According to urban legend, he's the reason that it floats. Oh, no kidding. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't have anything to do with this theory, though. <laughs> no, 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 no. But people right. have been thinking about this for a long yeah, time. They really yeah, have. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, um, okay, so there's a familiarity bias that is um, 
that runs through horses, and you're saying you're experimenting right now with what? Goldfish. With goldfish. This is this is pretty bizarre. Okay. So how do you how do you run this test with goldfish? Well, we haven't actually done it yet. I need to get approval by Animal Care and Use Committee at in West Lafayette. Uh, yeah. After they approve my protocol, but the protocol, the procedure. Yeah. How much do these goldfish cost you? <laughs> They're thirty cents a piece. Okay, and you got to get approval for what you do with them. They're animals. Okay, good. All right, go ahead. So, <laughs> so how's this work? Okay, so uh, basically, I'm going to give these goldfish a uh, two-color choice. Goldfish have excellent color vision. Oh, really? They're tetrachromats. They have four different kinds of cones instead of just three like us. And we have three. Yeah. We have three. Some women have four. Right, right. Anyway. Uh, so anyway, they're a good subject to replicate uh, this horse study. Okay, not using a T-shaped apparatus, but still uh, a, a two-choice apparatus. Now, when my students and I and Rob Halleck finish uh, with the apparatus, we'll have a flashing yellow light at one end of a gallon and a half aquarium. Yeah. Okay. With a motion sensor. Right. And uh, at the other end will be red, green, or blue LEDs mm -hmm. under which are motion sensors. And above which on both sides will be a pellet dispenser. I knew there was food involved. Got to be food. Okay. Yeah. And they're not going to be food deprived. Goldfish are voracious yeah. eaters. Right. Okay. So anyway. Uh, when uh, my students are also learning to program in Python on, ras on a Raspberry Pi uh, Zero W. Okay, this is a computer that's half the size of a credit card. Has okay. excellent I.O. capabilities. Uh, kids build robots using these things. So, so what's going to happen? Okay, what's going to happen is this is going to be a 24-hour uh, 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 seven day a week thing for a goldfish in a tank. They swim up to the to the yellow flashing light and that turns on a choice, okay? Uh, uh, the flashing light goes off and one or the other of the two lights, let's say red or green, come on, they swim to the correct one, half the fish would have green, half would have red, okay? Right. And when they approach it, both lights go off, pellet drops above where the light was, okay? Right. Three minutes later, flashing strobe light comes on again. Right. So they do this as much. It's a miniature version of the horse experiment. Basically, yeah. only automated. Right, okay? right, right. So when they have all. Nobody gets bit. N nobody yeah. is hurt yeah. in this experiment. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, when, uh, when the fish have experience and uh, demonstrate the ability to discriminate between these two, yeah. then we will replace the positive stimulus, the one that's previously reinforced, with blue, something they've never seen before. Right. And the other one will be something that they're familiar with. Right. And we fully expect those fish to go to the familiar one. If they Even though they should have been trained to not go to it because it didn't give right. them what they wanted. Nothing there. Yeah. That's very interesting. So, sorry, so let's, let's take this back to human beings now. Sure. Um, what, you know, what happens? Why is it that we're not always intellectually engaged in thinking, I want to do this, this is what I need to do, I've analyzed the situation, this is the best decision? Sure. Why is it that we're not always functioning like that? Why Think is it that we might fall back on something as primitive as, as familiarity as, bias? As a heuristic, a rule of thumb. Just think about the amount of time it takes to make that decision, okay? takes a lot of calories, actually. Our brain burns a lot of calories. Right. And if, if you have to make a decision suddenly, you don't have the time for it, you rely on these kinds of heuristics or rules of thumb. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, in thinking about this, I mean, what's the neurological basis of this, for this? Why would a goldfish and a horse and a person right. uh, behave in the same way uh, uh, operating on this bias? Yeah. When people think about how our memories are constructed, let's say, neurologically with right. neurons, uh, we generally talk about associative networks. Okay, okay. associative network. Right, where the more often a, a particular path between neurons is followed, uh, the stronger the, the connections get. Okay. And this takes repetition. Now, uh, This is why if you want to remember something from your sixth grade 
you know, uh, classroom experience uh, and it's something obscure, you might try to start by remembering something that's more familiar to you, right? Like your sure. the bicycle you had when you were sure, sixth grade. Sure, just anything the, that puts you in the that context. The mean look that the teacher was giving you, sure. or something like that, right? Yeah, and then and then you would branch out from that and right. get to the other right. other memories, right? Yeah, yeah. And it it would extend to uh, memories for meaning as well. Uh, when studying for a test, uh, the the best way to remember. Uh, what you're, you're going to be expected mm -hmm. to uh, produce in a test is to form connections, meaningful connections between concepts. So you know how things tie together. So when one node, as they say, gets activated, it spreads out and mm -hmm. activates other, other memories, other facts. Uh, this is why they tell you when you're working on your dissertation to turn it into an elevator speech and every time somebody asks you what you're working on to explain it to them. Very good. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, you've heard the 10,000 hour rule too. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Repetition, even just rote repetition. Yeah. A rote repetition is really a brute force way. It's uh, yeah. uh, in, in humans, I don't think goldfish have that capability right. to the extent we do to override right. Uh, right. Uh, these sorts of biases. but. Yeah, we can do that. So uh, let's define heuristic for, uh, for our viewers here. Well, I mean, technically, it's in everyday parlance, it's a rule of thumb. It's something that solves uh, a problem. Most of the time, doesn't always work. And we think of heuristic in opposition to what? To An algorithm, something that guarantees a solution, but takes Quite a, quite a bit more time. Okay, or just, we would just say rationality maybe, right? I mean, if we, we would say, you know, when we say we expect that we're reasoning something out, we were, yeah. we're weighing two sides of the argument, that's a bit of a, of a process, maybe it not is. an algorithm. An algorithm, and that, uh, the closest relationship to an algorithm there would be an MBA making a decision. You can never get enough information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There comes a time when you have to make a decision, and a decision is made reluctantly. With an algorithm, you may never uh, find all possible solutions. Well, you play chess. You play yeah. chess well. Yeah. Uh, think about going through every possible move uh, that you might make in response to right. somebody yeah. else's. Well, and that's the problem with playing computers, right? I mean, they you know they just have an infinite amount of. of calculations that they can make in a few seconds, and it's just... Oh, sure, but those are humans programming yeah, those computers, right, right. too. Um, well, so, uh, David, um, let's say you find out that this is true. I mean, you know, do we, you know, sh should we um, all be aware of this? Should we be guarding against this heuristic tendency, or, or is heuristic... Uh, decision making something that's a necessary part of our existence? I think so. I think we should. Uh, I don't know if we should go on a campaign as such. Yeah. Uh, Do we outlaw I mean, uh, familiarity campaigns no. for uh, political <laughs> office, maybe? No. Well, I think it's, it's, uh, it's good to know those things are operating in a political context, especially uh, when it comes to uh, autocrats. Uh, and the sorts of, of control exercised over people uh, in blatant opposition to the truth and reality. Yeah. Well, and so um, the, actually the, uh, the quote that I was reading a minute ago, um, he said that um, authoritarian institution and marketers have always, institutions and marketers have always known this. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think he had in mind? Well, he wrote that before Donald Trump. So it wasn't just the present situation that he was thinking about. Uh, I just think of, uh, of, of Hitler yeah. and his campaign. I mean, yeah. that propaganda is, is another, it's a, it's a pejorative for advertising, basically. Mm -hmm. they, they were intuitive advertisers. Repetition was uh, a key element. Anywhere in the world, you go today, there's yeah. going to be Coca-Cola. Right. Okay? Right. Uh, if you're looking for a soft drink somewhere, that yeah. may be the first thing to come to mind, especially if you don't have a, a, an existing preference. Right. I mean, it can be get to the extent where, well, there are other reasons for this as well. In the South, if you want a pop or a soda, as they say out east, yeah. you want a Coke. Right. Uh, can I have right. an orange Coke? Yeah. Yeah. Or a strawberry Coke. There might not be a Coke at all. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Well, so um, 
what, you know, I, I, what, how do we apply this? I guess, you know, the thing that comes to mind for me is I was running a campaign for someone who was running for sheriff in Will County, Illinois. And uh, there was a, a, a man named uh, Stan Wozniak who was on the uh, township board of directors. And when Wozniak ran his campaigns, and Wozniak had been in office for, I don't know, 25, 30 years, mm -hmm. um, he put out signs that just had his last name on them three mm -hmm. times. So you'd look at the sign, and it wouldn't say Wozniak for, sure, you know, for township yeah. clerk or something. It would yeah. just say Wozniak, Wozniak, Wozniak. It yes. was one sign, yeah. and then he would spread these signs all over town, sure. right? So when I was running this uh, campaign for sheriff, um, I had a meeting with the staff and uh, the campaign staff. I was doing the communication side of it. And, uh, and I said, okay, we need to talk about the sign. And they're like, we want to do what Stan Wozniak does. And I'm like, what's that? They go, well, you know, we want to say Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald on the signs. And I said, no. No, I don't, you know, I don't think we're going to do that. But you know, uh, now that I'm talking to you, I think maybe Wozniak was running a more sophisticated campaign than we were. I think he who, who won that race. Wozniak always won. I don't think yeah. he ever lost a yeah. race. And, Wozniak, and we Wozniak, won one Wozniak, and lost Wozniak. one in the Fitzgerald right? campaign. So okay. maybe I should, maybe I should have yeah. switched over. Repetition. I'm telling you. Yeah. 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 Well, so and, and so we can use uh, seriously. We can use the repetition to help us uh, sure. uh, a lot. And uh, uh, with students when they're studying, of course, right. Um, and then on the other hand, we need to guard against it, right? Because it's going to create a sense of familiarity, which, what is that? You know, I mean, if you look at this as cognition, is it, there's an emotional connection to this. I mean, where does it go? Where do, you know, why does familiarity draw us in? Why aren't, we, why aren't we opposed to familiarity? Why are we attracted to familiarity? I, I'm not sure, but maybe it's the devil you know versus the one you don't. Yeah. I don't know. People yeah. go to the same place on vacation all the time, don't they? Yeah, they do, yeah. I, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So do you think we're deluded? You know, do you think that we, we all think that we're smarter and more uh, careful and selective than we really are? I think uh, those of us who think about it think that, but I think a lot of people just don't think about it. Yeah. I mean, if, in fact, if you're thoughtful, uh, you can override this, this sort of bias. Of course. Uh, but if you're not thoughtful, if you're not deliberate, yeah in decision making, you're going to be more susceptible to it. I think this is really what we need to do in our educational system. What did Thomas Jefferson say about democracy and education? Now, I'm not going to quote him perfectly by any means, but as to my understanding, yeah. he said that what it would take to maintain a democracy was an educated electorate. Right. So let's let's start the, in first grade, or even yeah. better yet, in preschool. Yeah, uh, educating our kids. Yeah, and and uh, uh, producing children who are thoughtful. Not all of them are going to be good at math, and not yeah. all of them are going to be good at music, and most of them won't be good writers. Yeah, uh, but we can train them, I think, to think. Yeah. Well, I think one of the most interesting uh, things that I'm that I'm taking out of this is um, that when we don't to ask ourselves to become objective and look at things carefully, that um, we don't have a vacuum right. that we're working from. We actually have a tendency that's mm -hmm. there, that's yeah. a hidden tendency that's always going to be there Excellent. to go for what's familiar. Yeah. And so um, it's, uh, it's, it's maybe uh, uh, necessary to ask ourselves sometimes questions before we make decisions. Perfect. Yeah. OK, David. Well, thank you for being on the show and sure. uh, being interested time. in knowing the result of your goldfish experience. I'll let you know firsthand. Uh, <laughs> when you come up with that. How long will this last? Uh, well, we should be finished in a year. OK. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll have David back. That is all the time we have on our program. Thank you to uh, Dr. David Pick for joining me today on the Roundtable Perspective. I'm Tom Roach. See you next time.